In this talk today, we are going to try and imagine how Gandhiji would have reacted if he was present in the India and the world of today. In 2021, we are going to try and imagine if it is at all possible. I think it's a very difficult task to put yourself in somebody's shoes and that too into the shoes of somebody like Mahatma Gandhi and place yourself in a world far removed from the one in which he lived. After all, he died in 1948, almost 73 years ago. And to try and visualize how he would look at the world around him, how would he look at the India around him, what would he identify as the main issues which are before us today, how would he identify what is troubling and tormenting the poor of India? How would he imagine what the women of India are thinking? How would he try and imagine what the peasants of India are thinking? And how would he then formulate an agenda for action? How would he then think of what would be the best methods, what would be the best ways of going forward and expressing those urges, expressing those needs and trying to find solutions to those problems. This is the rather tough task that we are setting before ourselves today. Let's see what we can make of it. Obviously, we would have to base ourselves on what we know about Gandhiji's contribution both at the level of ideas as well as at the level of practice because as he said, my life is my message. So more than anything else, we have to look at the man in action, you know, what did he do? Of course, we do that through his words, we do that through other people's perceptions and then we try and in a way transport that into an imagination for today and try to work out how he would have seen things in 2021. There are a few issues which I have identified which I would like to take up because the whole gamut of uh, issues that are before the country today obviously and which would agitate somebody like Mahatma Gandhi if not possible to handle all of them. So I've identified a few of them, some I'll do at greater length, some I'll do more briefly. But these are the ones that I think would be the cause of major concern and attention for him. The first one would be the issue of the independence of India, the sovereignty of India, especially as expressed in her foreign policy in her economic policy, her international trade, her international relationship, economic relationships with the other powers. The second issue that I'd like to take up is that of the state of democracy and civil liberties today and how he would react to what was going on and what would be his agenda and what would be his solutions. The third issue that I would like to talk about is the ideal of an inclusive India. He believed that all those who lived in India had a right to be its citizens, full citizens. How would he look at what's been going on around us today? How would he look at the CAA? How would he look at the NRC? How would he look at the way we have been using uh, draconian legislation to put people behind bars? This is some of the issues that we'd like to look at. I would also like to see how he would translate his pro-poor agenda into today's India. As you all know, more than anything else, what was at the bottom of his heart, something that was of utmost concern to him all the time, was the state of India's poor. The dumb millions, as he sometimes called them. They were at the heart of his concerns and of his politics and of his method of struggle. How would he see their lives today? How would he react to the marginalization of the poor that we are seeing around us? How would he have reacted to the migrant workers going home with the lockdown? The rise in prices, crony capitalism. What solutions 
would he have for us? The issue of caste based discrimination. As you know, Gandhiji spent a lot of his time, a lot of his life addressing the issue of untouchability. I think he is the only person in Indian history to have carried on what was became famous as the Harijan tour, where for nine months continuously he toured the country, village by village, mohalla by mohalla, town by town, city by city, by every possible mode of transport, including boat and including walking, to raise the issue of untouchability and campaign against it. How would he see the situation today? The issue of women's rights, women's position in India. Again, that was something at, that was at the heart of Gandhiji's politics. That was at the heart of his concerns. I would like to talk to you about that today. And also the issue of the environment. What are we doing to the world? Issues of climate change, the kind of storms that we are having. The whole of US has been agitated with a major storm in this last week. We are having so many events uh, where floods and all kinds of other natural disasters have been hitting us. And all over the world, it's now understood. Gandhiji, I, I would like to believe, was somebody who was prescient in this. And he said long ago, we have enough for everybody's need, but not enough for everybody's greed. I think those issues have all come, become prominent before us today. And finally, more than anything else, for me, Gandhi stands for resistance. Resistance to all kinds of oppression, all kinds of discrimination, all kinds of unfreedom. How would he situate himself as the architect of resistance? What advice would he have? for the people of India, the women who fought against the CAA and the NRC, the students who were in that agitation, the farmers who are still knocking on the doors and today have had this massive Mahapanchayat in uh, uh, Muzaffarnagar. What would he say? How would he comment on their methods? Would he be happy that somewhere what he had taught has been learnt by people or would he have some more advice to give? These are some of the issues, though briefly, that I would like to talk to you today. Let me first take up the issue of independence and sovereignty. Very briefly, I think all of us are aware. Let me take the example of what's happened in the last one month or even less. Uh, suddenly Afghanistan has burst onto our TV screens, burst onto our newspapers, burst onto every possible uh, mode of communication. But what are we seeing? I, f I find that India has no voice. We were silent. We were among the first to pick up our bags and vacate our embassy in Afghanistan. We didn't even stay long enough to help Indian nationals uh, evacuate. And where are we in terms of influencing anything that's going on in the world? I think Gandhiji would be extremely perturbed about this. He would be extremely concerned about this. Because even before we became free, India had a voice in international affairs. We had our opinions about everything, whether it was fascism in Europe, or whether it was racism uh, in the US, or whether it was apartheid in South Africa. After all, Gandhiji himself spent 20 years or more of his life struggling against racial discrimination in Africa. So he understood international issues very well. I think he would be extremely perturbed, and I think the agenda that he would set before us was the agenda which we actually successfully practiced after independence under the guidance of Jawaharlal Nehru, which was that we, even though we were a poor country, underdeveloped country, but we had an independent foreign policy. So we had an independent voice in foreign affairs. Today on Afghanistan, we are not even called to the high table. 
there was a time when despite our poverty despite our backwardness india was in the thick of things whether it was vietnam whether it was the korean war whether it was un forces being sent to different places in the congo india always had a voice it had an opinion i i still remember very well when this whole trouble started in afghanistan when uh, you know there was an attempt to overthrow the progressive government and then finally at one point the soviet union came in uh, to support that progressive uh, government and there was a lot of turmoil i still remember indira gandhi taking a position even though we were friends with the soviet union she took an independent position and said i don't think it's a good idea what the soviets have done to openly come in to support all i'm saying is that we had an independent voice and that was a result of the struggle that had been led primarily at the helm was gandhi ji and i think today he would be extremely concerned and the agenda that he would set for us was that we regain our independent voice we regain our sovereignty we do not become junior partners of anybody whether it is the us or whether it is the uk or whether it is china or whether it is russia we must have our own independent voice in international affairs it is not just a function of your stage of development or how wealthy you are similarly i think in the aspect of international economic relations i think somewhere the way we find our agenda our economic agenda being dictated to by the interests of multinationals by the interests of countries other than our own i think it's something again that he would definitely put on the agenda and have a plan of action as to how without talking about atmanirbhar as we do but doing the opposite i think what he would do would be to actually become more and more atmanirbhar rather than talk about and have loud slogan saying atmanirbhar on democracy and civil liberties i think this would be i would like to assert would be a major concern to gandhi ji and to convince you of that let me begin uh, by uh, just giving you a quote from him to show that how deep was his conviction in uh, civil liberties uh, and democracy uh, i'd first begin with civil liberties especially because i think we've lost a lot of civil liberty in the last few years i quote liberty of speech means that it is unassailed even when the speech hurts liberty of the press can be said to be truly respected only when the press can comment on the severest terms upon and even misrepresent matters freedom of association is truly respected when assemblies of people can discuss even revolutionary projects certainly he would not have approved of the way uapa has been used in the bhima koregaon case how people who have not even engaged in revolutionary uh, projects have been put behind bars the only line that he drew was that of non violence i quote civil liberty consistent with the observance of non violence is the first step towards swaraj it is the breath of political and social life it is the foundation of freedom there is no room here for dilution or compromise it is the water of life and how did he put these ideas into practice how did he treat those with whom he had ideological and political differences it's not just a question of statements of faith in civil liberties but actually living out these conceptions which i have just talked about that is actually defending people with whom you do not agree defending your opponents defending people with whom you may have sharp differences not just allowing them to be not just allowing them to exist or speak but actually coming out and defending their right to speech and i could give you many examples of that but uh, i would like to just uh, maybe give one short uh, example which is when during the quit uh, when the quit india movement was about to be launched 
and there was this meeting in the Gowalia tank uh, in Bombay just before the movement was actually uh, broke out. On the 8th of uh, August, uh, the resolution that was being discussed was the Quit India resolution, which was that a movement, Gandhiji would be given the authority to start a movement. And there, uh, the, the, the communists who were members of the All India Congress Committee, as you know, they were there in the Congress, some members got up and they objected to it and they said they did not agree with this because they had a different uh, understanding of the international situation and they felt that India going in for a, a movement against the British government would harm the international cause against fascism. Now, these were different uh, uh, these, these were not differences of ideology so much as they were differences of tactics, of strategy, of methods. What is the right thing to do right now? But the atmosphere in Bombay in that meeting, there were thousands there. The atmosphere was surcharged in favor of the Quit India movement. And here were these few individuals who got up and made speeches and said that they disagreed. The, you, could, you could just sense the hostility towards them. And what does Gandhiji do? He then takes the floor and he gives a speech in which he says, I praise the courage of my friends who have had the independence to state their point of view clearly. And he says, they have done what I have been doing for the last so many years. I have never hesitated to speak out in a lone voice when everybody else is thinking something different. So my friends have only emulated what I have been doing for the last so many years. What was he doing with this statement? He was throwing a protective cover around these communists who were obviously going to be the butt of ridicule and could even be subjected to physical attacks by the crowd because such was the strong sentiment in favor of Quit India. By, protect, by coming out in support of them, by protecting and even admiring their courage, protecting their right to speak and admiring their courage, he actually told the people that, look, you, uh, this is a fine thing to do. And there were so many other ways in which, uh, I, what examples that I could uh, give. And as far as democracy is concerned, it's also a question, I think he emphasized and so did Nehru always, that democracy is about dialogue. Democracy is not a question of numbers. It's not a question of majorities. Democracy means you must listen to opponents. You must listen to those who differ with you. I would say today, what is happening, our farmers are shouting loudly for the last nine months, but there is no dialogue. And here Gandhiji would say, you can dialogue with people who, with whom you don't agree at all. He even called the revolutionaries for a dialogue. They believed in violence. But he said, let's dialogue. And then he said to them, you know, I don't know whether your methods are going to be the ones that Indians will follow or whether they'll follow mine. But for, for give me a chance to try my methods. You've been trying yours for a while. And if while I'm trying my methods, if there is violence, if your methods come in between, my method will not get an opportunity to be tried. And would you believe it? This is non-cooperation movement time. The, the revolutionaries actually suspended their methods for the period of the non-cooperation movement. They said, sure, you try your methods. That was the level of dialogue that was possible between people who disagreed on fundamentals between violence and non-violence and yet they could talk. And this is what Gandhiji would say today. He would say it to the rulers, he would say it to the ruled, he would say it to the rebels, don't reject dialogue. You must dialogue. No society can function without dialogue. Inclusive India. That's the other issue that I want to uh, come to today. Because I think one of the biggest problems that Gandhiji would see in the country today is the polarization that has been uh, literally injected into our uh, social and political uh, uh, life, uh, where on the grounds of religion, people have been pushed into uh, rallying against each other. I think this is something that would, uh, would 
hurt him and this is something that he would devote a very very large uh, part of his time to. So in terms of an agenda he would certainly set an agenda in, tr in trying to handle that problem and let me give you some examples to, uh, to convince you that what I am saying has some uh, relevance, has some uh, validity. Uh, I am again going to qu quote to you from his very famous uh, uh, speech at uh, the, just before the Quit India Movement, the 8th August speech 1942, where he says, now he is giving a call for action and at the same time he is telling the people that you have to be very careful. No, no division on the basis of religion. This is what he says. He says, those Hindus who like Dr. Munje and Sri Savarkar believe in the doctrine of the sword may seek to keep the Muslims under Hindu domination. I do not represent that section. I represent the Congress. The Congress does not believe in the domination of any group or any community. It believes in democracy which includes in its orbit Muslims, Hindus, Christians, Parsis, Jews, every one of the communities inhabiting this vast country. Millions of Muslims in this country come from Hindu stock. How can their homeland be any other than India? My eldest son, he says, embraced Islam some years back. What would his homeland be? Porbandar or the Punjab? I ask the Muslims, if India is not your homeland, what other country do you belong to? In what separate homeland would you put my son who embraced Islam? The Congress belongs to the whole nation. It is open to the Muslims to take possession of the Congress. They can, if they like, swamp the Congress by their numbers and can steer it along the course which appeals to them. It would hurt me to hear of a single instance of a Muslim being killed by a congressman. See how clear he is, sharp. In the coming revolution, congressmen will sacrifice their lives in order to protect the Muslims against a Hindu's attack and vice versa. It is a part of their creed and it is one of the essentials of nonviolence. This was the strength with which he believed in an inclusive India, in Hindu-Muslim unity, in lack of polarization, in the right of everybody to live in this land. It is all their homeland. So you can well imagine what would be the, a man like that, what kind of agenda he would set for us today and how pained he would be by what's going on. I would just like to take a minute or two because I think the issue of women's rights and women's position and the discrimination against women is a very important part and has to be part of any political agenda that we formulate today. So I think we must know how Gandhiji would have uh, imagined the agenda today. Gandhiji in his lifetime, in his work, was uncompromising in the matter of women's rights. I quote, in my opinion, she should labor under no legal disability not suffered by man. I should treat daughters and sons on a footing of perfect equality. Rajkumari Amrit Kaur tells us, that those who tried to argue with him on the basis of what Manu is supposed to have said, that for women there can be no freedom because of what is contained in some texts in the Smritis, they were treated with contempt. Such sayings or texts were not sacrosanct to him at all. He rejected them. He paid equal attention and gave equal place to girls and women. In his ashram, there was an air of freedom and self-confidence in the girls and women that lived under his care, whether it was Sevagram or whether it was Sabarbati. Nothing delighted him more than the success of women in any sphere of life, we are told, by the women inmates of the ashram. If ever he wished to elicit the opinion of his co-workers on any matters connected with the ashram or any new undertaking, he paid equal attention and let equal weight to the views of women workers. I quote again, To call women the weaker sex is a libel. It is man's injustice to women. If by strength is meant brute strength, then indeed women is less brute than man. If by strength is meant moral power, then woman is immeasurably man's superior. 
that is how he saw. So we can well imagine that he would set a very radical agenda for the women's cause today. I don't have time to go into more details on this. On the issue of environment, I think I already spoke and there's not time to elaborate, but I am convinced that he would make that a very central part, a crucial part of the political agenda before the people today. Because he was deeply concerned about the way industrial capitalism had built on the whole principle of consumption and overconsumption. And he was convinced that the world just cannot survive if it went on like this. He would have been, I think, a prime green politician if he was alive today and he would make that a very crucial part of the agenda of uh, action. Similarly, on the issue of caste discrimination, I think we should have no doubt that he would have taken a clear-cut stand that it is high time that caste discrimination, whatever there is, of whatever kind there is, must end. What uh, uh, Panekia he would have suggested there are various kinds of views about Gandhiji on the issue of caste. Some people feel Ambedkar was more radical. Some people feel Gandhi didn't have the right answer. The issue is not whether who had the right answers. The issue is whether you agree that, that it must be on the agenda. And then, of course, there can be differences. There can be debates over what is the best way. Is the reservation the best way? Can only reservation take us forward? What kind of support do we need? Do we need other kinds of solutions? Is resistance important? Are movements important? After all, he led movements against untouchability uh, and against ending of caste discrimination. Is intermarriage the solution? He encouraged intermarriage in his ashram. So whatever it is, my point is that he would certainly put it on the agenda because it had be, he had put it on the agenda of the freedom struggle at that time. And then finally, what I would like to end with is that Gandhiji's solution, after putting things on the agenda, his solution or his advice or his prescription of how to take that agenda forward, more than anything else, what he would rely on was resistance. His understanding was that when you see discrimination, when you see oppression, it is your obligation to resist. If you do not resist, you are complicit with the oppressor. There is no midway. Silence or distance is not an answer. So I would like to emphasize that Satyagraha, what he called Satyagraha, for Gandhiji, it was not an abstract philosophical concept, but it was a weapon that was forged in the flame of struggle and sharpened on the whetstone of hard political practice. The heart and soul of Satyagraha is resistance, resistance to any form of wrongdoing or unfreedom, whether it is racism, communalism, caste oppression, patriarchy, denial of democracy, iniquity or economic deprivation. And it encompasses a vast array of forms of struggle bounded only by the limits set by nonviolence. And here, therefore, what I would say is that putting all this together, I think where Gandhiji's heart would lie and the direction in which he would point our attention would be, he would say, look at the movements that are going on around you. Look how the women and the youth took up cudgels. And if it hadn't been for the lockdown, we don't know what would have happened in the anti-CA and anti-NRC movement. If ever there was a truly Gandhian movement, in my opinion, the one direction in which Gandhiji would point our attention, he would say, look at what's actually going on. Look at the movements of resistance that are going on today in India. Learn from them, build on them, consolidate them. And he would point our attention, first and foremost, to the movement that emerged against the NRC and the CAA. The women and the youth of India were in the forefront of that movement. To a large extent, it was a spontaneous uh, movement. People were their own leaders, just as Gandhiji had told the people of India in 1942. Every man will be his own leader. 
do or die was the slogan which he gave but there were very few directions on what you were supposed to do but do something or die in the attempt he would point definitely to the movement of the farmers of the peasants which has been now going on for almost a year nine months they've sat at the doors of delhi but even before that from july onwards when the legislation was passed this movement has been going on again a movement with a decentralized local leadership but a very powerful movement nonetheless just as various sections of the national movement and peasant movements during that time of the freedom struggle were look at by what happened in bardoli so this he would point to these and he would say build your strategy of resistance to the unfreedom you are experiencing to the evil that you are seeing around you to the oppression that you are seeing around you to the polarization that you are seeing around you build your resistance on the basis of what's actually emerging in society because that's what he done all his life he was once asked how do you create a movement and he said i have never created a movement in my life the only difference between you and me he said is that when i see something positive stirring in people's hearts i seize upon it i give it a shape i give it a direction and that's what a leader is supposed to do so this is what he would say to you seize upon the good that you see around you build that into a movement of resistance and go forward and resistance begets resistance the more people lose their fear the more others around them lose the fear and that's how mass movements develop that's how gandhi ji developed all his mass movements one by one from a frightened demoralized people he turned the masses of india the illiterate poor masses of india into a fine fighting force which could defeat the biggest empire in the world and that's what he would say to you if we could do it if we could defeat the biggest empire in the world with much more fascistic methods than we have today with far greater capacities to divide us than we have even today surely you can today you just have to have the faith and have the courage and go forward